Uh, you will not be very long. My staff will tell you that I don't believe in having things go too long. Um, when we were getting ready, uh, my assistant said, well, you know, you're going to have to probably be up there talking for 15 minutes. And I always remind her, the only two people that should be talking for 15 minutes, either the President of the United States or the Pope. And since I'm not a natural born citizen and considering the election, I most certainly will not be giving a presidential address. <laughs> and she will tell you because of my sitting ways, you'll hear nothing from the Vatican about me. But I, so we're going to get rolling today and there are a couple things I want us to go through. First, I want to just make sure there's a little bit more detail about my bio because I, I'm always concerned when I attend these things. Sometimes folks don't fully understand the individual I was speaking to and their experiences she or he at the end, and I think it's important to understand. When I was at the Office of Policy and Management, for those that you don't know, because I understand it's a wide variety of audience here today. We have students, we have professionals from the state, but also we have a number of people from private industry. The Office of Policy and Management runs the state. You can do nothing in the state of Connecticut without coming through the Office of Policy and Management. Yes, the Lieutenant Governor constitutionally is second in command of the state, but the fact of the matter is the Secretary, and keep in mind, of all the officer agencies in the state, the person who is head of OPM does not have the title of commissioner. They have the title of secretary, showing that they are above equal of equals, are really is a very important and influential division. And if you want to know what they do, they are the chief budget officer of the state. Chief budget officer. And in fact, for most state agencies, the individual who decides whether you have a position or not. So my time at OPM was wonderful because I got to learn about every agency meeting from members of the corrections department who had interesting ways of presenting things to the state police, to higher education, back and forth. It was, I learned in a few years things that most people would take a lifetime to try and learn about because everything comes through OPM one way or the other. Uh, research One University, um, UConn is a very small Research One University compared to like a UCLA or Ohio State. But it's sort of a city unto itself, their own police department, their own fire department, their own athletic department. They're up there in stores where, you know, there really is nothing else but the University of Connecticut. Thousands of employees, millions of dollars in, in research. And the president, though has the title of president, is really like a mayor in, ma in many ways of a small municipality. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great place to learn about um, higher education, but particularly about public organizations because of its size and its breadth of things they do. Work directly for a number of university presidents. In many ways, most important things come by the university president. You learn a lot of things from collective bargaining to issues within in, um, intercollegiate athletics. A lot of things you learn doing those sort of things. I've been involved with organizations, 12 to 20 to 26,000 students, capital budgets from five to 250 million, operating budgets for a wide variety, and staff, as was mentioned earlier. We're going to cover a few things today. Definition of diversity issues, private versus public, very important to understand. When I talk to my friends in private industry, they do A, B, and C by breakfast. I tell them I can't do A, B, and C for three years. And I, they say, but, but it's ridiculous. You ought to go and fire someone. I'm like, that's what I can't do in three years. Um, manage, managers versus leaders. Why am I talking about managers versus leaders to this group? Because a lot of folks talk about it, but don't really understand it. There are some differences. I know some folks that are tremendous managers. I would never recommend them to be a leader. And I actually believe that you can't be a good leader unless you're a good manager. This business that there's a complete definition and they're separate is just not true. I don't believe it go the direction goes both ways. Why diversity matters, a critical matter to understand. First, diversity definitions. There are a number of things we're going to cover here. Not the usual ones just about race or gender or sexual orientation or age. But funding, why am I discussing funding? A wide variety of things involving funding. We have professors here in the, right now sitting in the back, and they'll tell you, you know, for grants, there are certain requirements they have to meet. There are certain things they have to do. There are certain universities that can have certain grants that others can't. It is, a, it is an issue that the institution has to meet, including financial aid in there. Everybody knows what Title IX is? How do you think the federal government has ultimate control of public higher education? Financial aid is a critical part of that. Physical abilities. I was over here talking to the doctor for the university, the chief uh, medical doctor for the university, and she's telling me, Richard, I need to put this lift in for students who are in wheelchairs in the back of her office. And I got some money for it. So I asked, well, how much money do you have? I think she told me $30,000. $30, so after I got off the floor at a couple of laughs, I'm like, $30,000? She goes, but that's what it costs somewhere else. I said, this is public higher education. And first of all, we had already made some decisions about that, but talk to me about, about it later. Very important issue, constituencies. 
This is one of our constituencies. It is a diverse group. You have to understand how to interact with them. Judicial issues, alumni issues. The Vice President for Institutional Advancement is right now in the back of the room. I make it a point not to make a major decision without taking all of these things into consideration because somewhere along the line, somebody's going to be offended about a major decision you make. I remember the former president here, Dr. Miller, once said to me, Richard, I think that decision is absolutely the right decision. And I was trying to figure out why he thought so, because the fact of the matter is everybody didn't like the decision. And he goes, that's why it's the right decision, because nobody likes the decision. And the fact that nobody's happy means that the decision is probably best of the institution. You didn't pick one over the, over the other. Parents, critical constituents, a diverse group. I've had everything from parents come and tell me about they're very upset that the blue devil is our mascot, that it offends their Christian sensibilities to individuals who tell me that the blue level is the greatest things we've had since sliced bread. And you have to figure out how to deal with those things. So diversity is a wide definition, and I'm going to use it as a wide definition today, if you're really going to lead and manage a public organ, a diverse public organization. A few statistics, head counts for enrollment at Central. I think it's important to understand. Something important to pick up here. Central actually has more men than women. Usually it's the other way around for comprehensive public universities. There are more women than men. Women actually graduate more, but Central has it the other way. Uh, percentage of the ethnicity rates, international. We have a low international number on whites, whites others. Uh, employee statistic headcount. This number is really higher, but that was the number I chose them to go with. This is an interesting thing here on diversity issues. If you look at the rate of actual pay for female professors versus male professors, do you think that it's generally equal? I'm saying that because we actually have the professors done the study in the back of the room. There are a number of issues here that the institution has to keep in mind. The entire campaign, part of the discussion about equal pay for the genders remains an issue, and it's not an issue that higher education is exempt from. Race issue. These are just the overall numbers. Let's talk about private versus public for a while. There are a lot of different definitions. I sort of like this one um, ov overall. It's really basically what the government is prepared to get into or not get into to a degree. Private, their main driver is profit. Let's face it, their main driver is to make money if it's public held institution for the shareholders. That's their main driver. Their regulation tied highly flexible trends. They can change things, you know. It's not Facebook today, it's Snapchat, it's this. We can figure out what we want to do. Their demographics are important to them. Opinions are very important to them. Diversity matters to a degree are voluntary, are voluntary. You can have an organization which everybody's a left-handed Bowlesville salesman. Chances are, if you're successful, nobody's going to say anything to you. You may have some nasty comments made about it from other organizations, but there's really nothing anybody can do to it, about it, to a degree. Public. Our different drivers in public are law, mission, policy, poli uh, political, budget. We are regulatory enforcers. We enforce the regulation. We are rigid, systematic, paternalistic, sort of like your father giving you a lecture to a degree. Diversity matters to a degree are expected or mandated. They are different. They are different. I recall there was a time when I was at the university in stores, a little community college, that there was a significant disagreement between the president of the university and a dean. In fact, dean of deans, the dean of arts and sciences, over a tenure decision. And the president made a decision to grant tenure. The dean objected to that. In fact, resigned. Heated email, heated um, letters, very public. The board didn't. I went home that day and I ran into my landlord and he says to me, what's the sum of reading about the dean talking back to the president? Why don't you just fire that guy? And I said, fire that guy. Not only is that individual tenured, highly published, dean, and leads the largest faculty in the entire university, but he's the dean. He is, he's involved in the tenure decision. The president had his decision. He had this decision difference between a private perspective involving a public perspective. Totally different things. That dean retired with a pretty good retirement. So did the president, by the way. Managers versus leaders. We'll go through this real, real quickly. There are some differences between them. 
I think this overall definition about who looks at the trees and who needs the details is important. But quite frankly, it sort of mixes together. And what are the characteristics I'm going to give you, what I think are the important characteristics for public organization. My specialty, my PhD is really public or leading public organizations at a very high level. In fact, my main specialty is governors and higher education. That is, in fact, what my dissertation was on. Um, what, um, know what your people are doing and why. Very, very important. I always tell my staff, the one thing you don't want to say to a legislature is, let me explain. <laughs> Usually, that leads to other questions and things that are going on. This also goes for the private folks. Have you guys heard of Wells Fargo? Yeah. And not knowing what your people are doing and why. I believe that CEO is out of a job this week. Mm -hmm. Managed by walking around. It is very, very important. The staff will tell you that I probably don't want XCOM members. You will see. And there's a rule within my staff, my direct reports. If you don't see me for, the next, for three days in a straight, you better make it a point to find me. That something is just not right, because I need to know what's going on and see where, where everybody is and everybody coming in. It's very, very important, particularly when you have 24 operations. I'm in charge of the police department, and I tell this story um, often enough, and now I'm recording, so I don't mind saying it now because the individuals are tired. I showed up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning three consecutive days and found out that the head of that shift had booked off three consecutive days. Following morning, I went to the chief and said, are you aware that the commander of that ship had booked off three consecutive days? No. Why aren't you aware of that? A lot of things happen at midnight, particularly those party times. Was not aware of that and that it, it was, was occurring. That was straightened out when you have 24 operators, particularly when you're involved in public safety issues. Who reports directly to you? Critically important. Very difficult to do. Very difficult to do in a public setting. Easier in a higher setting. Most places when you're hired, you come in, the staff is set, and you have to work with that group. You have to work with that group. I'm sure I'm seeing pains on the face of those who work in public, public um, operations. Very difficult. Particularly if you come into a group, think about it. I have three, maybe about 300 employees, five different bargaining units. Everyone from those who never went to high school to those who have a PhD, a wide variety of individuals, hold people accountable up front. Sounds simple. Why am I giving you something so basic? I can't tell you how many times, and it happened just last week, I'm sitting in a meeting, we're going over an issue with an employee, and all these negative things are coming out. And I'm saying, well, I'm looking at the evaluations. They're all wonderful. I'm sort of confused why all of a sudden this employee is a problem. Because according to this evaluation, which are these, are these not your signatures? <laughs> Everything was, quote unquote, hunky-dory. Well, I said, well, you know what? You're going to have to live with that decision. Because you weren't holding them account all along. I go back to the police department example. Very rarely does anybody book off on shifts now because they don't know when I'm going to show up. <laughs> Very rarely. Respect your colleagues. People who get promoted and move through usually are those who aren't overly disagreeable. This doesn't mean you're a doormat, but this does mean that you have to have a certain level of understanding with the other person's perspective. Um, my staff will tell you when I disagree, I disagree. I'm not going to say I'm going to disagree, but don't keep it personal. Um, be careful what you put in writing. I'll give you two words if you don't think what you're putting around is important. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> My father, an old corporate guy, told me this a long time ago. He lived to be 90-something. He goes, be careful what you put in writing. It'll come back to haunt you. And particularly now with digital things, it'll come back to haunt you. This is very important for those of us in the public sector because we, are, we have record retention requirements. Record retention requirements that you do not have in the private sector. We have to keep records for quite a period of time. Notes, scratches on the side. You get a note from, I, I always chuckle when I get a note from um, our legal counsel. The AG has determined that because of this case, all your records are to be maintained and kept. And I'm thinking, what did I write on the side of that note in that middle of that hearing or something going on? Because if you don't believe some lawyer is going to paste it together and come together, that's going to happen. Be careful what you put, what you put in writing. 
do not pass the monkey. This is an old Harvard thing. Public and private, very important to understand if you want to lead an organization. You're walking down the hallway, and one of your employees says, you know, by the way, Sally May's got some issues going on. Oh, yeah? Interesting. OK. All right. Two weeks later, you find out Sally May's issues could possibly lead to Hartford Current headlines. And what do you think the first thing the head of your is going to say? What did you know, and when did you know it? Well, I told Dr. Bates in the hallway. No, you told me Sally May had some issues in the hallway. You didn't tell me that the issues were explosive. So it's a very important, and you, passing the monkey is something that happens all the time. No, 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 and I'm going to give you a perfect example of it. I have just been employed here, I think, for a year or two. And I'm passing the hallway, and I think the, the time the dean of arts and sciences, oh, we're trying to do this little thing with an experiment. We want to put something on the roof in Copernicus, which is the building right here, the science building. And I'm like, yeah, OK, sounds fine. I kept on walking. Come to find out, it was a laser measuring the sky, requiring the FAA. We had to buy a vehicle. It was like, I get a call, not from the provost, not from the president, but an individual named Bill Sevis, the chancellor of the system, mm -hmm. saying, Richard, A, B, C, D. And I'm thinking to myself, I was just in the hallway. They were just resting something on the roof. No, 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 no. It was much more than that. Sometimes people will try and pass the monkey to you. If anybody says in the hallway, well, you know, Sally May, well, no, 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 no. What does that mean? And you're just telling me so there's nothing else, right? So you could hold them back, counter on it. Quality is a rule, not an exception. If people make promises to you or everything is mediocre, then that's what you're going to get at. But if they know when they come before you as your head of the agency that they'd better have their ducks in order, understand what's going on, and the final product will be quality, chances are it's going to be quality. People make mistakes, things won't work, but at least you've tried your best. There's no agreement on what leadership is. I really think leadership is what people think it is. Very, very important. We've learned that over and over, particularly in this long campaign. It's what people decide it is. And that's very important to understand. And that leads to the next one. You really can't lead if nobody's prepared to follow you. Goes back to my point that I think there are some tremendous managers I know. I mean, these individuals are top of line managers. But I don't believe anybody would follow them if they were head of the organization. They just don't bring that about. There is a difference. Critical importance in a public organization. If you were head of the town, if you were chair of the finance committee for a town, and you get up there and your numbers don't make any sense, you're going to have a problem. I have a live example of that. I went to a small private high school in the Caribbean where I grew up. We had an individual, I won't say the school, who was going around the country recruited. They recruit from the school. There were some pretty good students at this school. I mean, I don't admit to be one of them. And <laughs> they were. Um, on the, he was at the front of the board going over all these numbers, financial aid and what it would cost and the discounting back and forth. And I was actually in the back. I was actually the side, in fact, with my friends in the senior class. We were jockeying, kidding around. You know, we were in high school. We weren't really paying attention. We were there because our parents were there. And somebody in the back of the room yells out, you missed a thousand. And I'm like, who's making this comment? And I look and it's my father. My dad graduated number one in his engineering class. He's pretty bright. The guy's back and forth, and he goes, oh, yeah, I did. How many parents do you think paid attention to the rest of that thing as it went on? It was an embarrassment. He's from some elite private school in the Midwest. I won't say the school. And my dad did that in his head. I'm not my dad. I wouldn't have done it in my head. I actually was wondering. And I went home and actually told my mother, you know, that was sort of embarrassing today. <laughs> and my mother was like, well, what happened? And she goes, but was he right? He goes, yeah, he was right, but it was embarrassing. She was like, oh, please. Not, not um, you need, when you're getting up doing numbers, you need to make sure they sort of add up in public. That's the point. Uh, Kennedy, Bay of Pigs disaster, gets up and tells the country, takes responsibility. I one kiddingly told the president of Yukon, I said, you know, I, that was my mistake. It shouldn't have. I take full responsibility. And he goes, okay, that's, that's fine. 
but if it happens again, I'm going to fire you. But I'll let you pass this time. He was kidding at the time. Um, but he was pretty impressed that I took responsibility for it. Um, and he was even more happy that I didn't let him get blamed for it. I say this more for the students in the room. We live in a cycle today where everything is like this. You know, news cycles are no longer like this. It's like this now. It happens in Egypt. We know immediately in our cell phones what's going on. And so we got to think and get through and do our things immediately. That's not really true. It takes a while to get somewhere. I worked for a president who took three times to become the head of his university. Three times. When I do the orientation for the new employees, um, they know that I think an interesting management movie, believe it or not, is The Godfather, of how to run a diverse, to a degree, not in terms of ethnically, um, <laughs> operation. And I actually go through a number of key things that comes from Don Colleone, that management. And this is one of the important ones. If you've ever seen The Godfather at a certain incident that occurs, and he says, you know, leave the gun, take the cannoli. And I remind those in public operations today that you should never take the cannoli either because somebody's going to tell on you. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed somebody's going to tell on you. And I always like to give specific examples. I don't like to talk about things and not give it examples. We were up the hill here um, renovating a residence hall. We were taking things out of it, building, and there were some old marble. You know, these buildings are marble. It's a bathroom part. And they were throwing them in a dumpster. Throwing them in a dumpster. Well, one of my employees decided, hey, you know, that would look great somewhere in my house. Dumpster dives. 30 minutes later, a phone call to HR. HR wants to see me. What's going? Is it true that Joe Schmo was stealing marble from the university? I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Come to find out, we were throwing always in a dumpster. So we had to go through this whole thing. Now that individual, of course, name has been in HR, so it's now always being considered for something. Leave the cannoli alone. <laughs> Somebody is going to tell on you somewhere along the line. Yeah. The person who thinks your friend today is, quote unquote, going to drop a dime someday on something. Mm -hmm. Master the art of succeeding through others. Tip O'Neill was right. All politics is local, particularly in large, diverse organizations. Go down and tell that small unit, you guys did a great job, and that's why we're so victorious. Then go to the unit next door and say the same thing. <laughs> and they're all going to come out thinking they were victorious. And they probably will. And those individuals are always going to give you 100%. This is so true. Um, I am trying to train for a semi-triathlon in the Caribbean in May. And... <laughs> The most difficult part about it is not the run or the bike. It's sitting on the pool, the pool shelf at around 8 o'clock at night here, debating of whether I'm going to jump into that cold water or not, and looking at the, the, um, the lifeguards. And you can see in their mind, and their usual female thinking, is he going to do it or is he going to get up and go back in the locker room? Is he going to do it or get around? And I have to just take that plunge and get it over it. Going up in the Caribbean and jumping in a, pool, a cold pool at 8 o'clock at night is not my kind of thing. Um, but it's so very important. I really want to emphasize this more than anything. So I want you to pass these around because I think this is a critical management tool for public and private that people just don't understand. And I want you to fully pick it up. Silence as a management or leadership tool. If our chief of police was here today, he will tell you that most cases are broken because people can't keep their mouth shut. <laughs> they're on Facebook, they're on Snapchat, they're doing something. They can't keep their mouth shut. You know, we had all this clown thing going on about a month ago. Yeah. Who's a clown, who's not a clown? <laughs> well, I just came out of one of these pool incidents that I have. And I'm coming out, and also I see the police are coming by, and the kids are going all over the place. I'm like, what is going on? And then right off the bat, as I'm saying that, my state phone is ringing. It's the chief of police on the line. Richard, we had a clown incident. And I'm thinking, of, are you kidding me? Are you being served? We have a clown incident going on. I said, where? He said, it was somewhere over here. And the kids chased after him. And I'm like, well, what were you going to do when they caught him? He said, well, they all had masks. They got in the car and drove off. And I said, was it a clown car? And he goes, and he goes I'm being serious. I said, all right, whatever. <laughs> Next day, of course, they had masks. Next day, we break the case. He calls me, he goes, we're going to be making some arrests. And I'm like, I'm thinking of some major arrests. He's talking about the clowns. I'm like, you're making an arrest of the clowns? How do you even know? They all have masks on. You know what happened? 
They went back to their place and they talked to somebody and the person turned them in. <laughs> person turned them in. And then now they're gonna be charged with, you know, creating, I don't know, whatever the charges the cops come up with when they can't come up with something real. Um, <laughs> they're gonna charge with this sort of thing. So that's gonna now all go down because they couldn't keep their mouth shut. <coughs> we had an employee we made a major arrest on who went and told the officers that his stuff was stolen and he lost tens of thousands of dollars. So the detectives went and they did a computer search and it all kept coming back to him. He actually told on himself. He actually told on himself. People cannot resist the idea of shooting their mouth off. Um, the best way to keep a secret is to tell no one. That's the best way to keep a secret. And I really want you to understand it is critical there was a survey recently done about former, recently retired, I believe it is, university presidents. You know what they said the number one thing that helped make them successful? They kept their own counsel. They didn't discuss what they were doing or when they were going to do it. They kept their own counsel. They might have just talked around the edges just to get a sense, but they really never told you what they were going to do or what was going on in, in their head. And I particularly like this one. Success is a sum of X, Y, and Z. For X is work, Y is play, and Z is keeping your mouth shut. <laughs> I think it's very, very important to understand it. And my other one that I, I really like is, um, is really from De Gaulle, which is nothing strengthens authority as much as silence. So you have the list. Why does these things matter on a diversity area in leading a public organization? Because I really believe that is the difference between success or failure. And our strength really doesn't come from through the organization. You know the old saying that the, the preachers would say, the church isn't the building, it's the people. It's the people. Lots of affirming, very little action. We are very good at this in public organizations. We are very good at doing a lot of affirming, but very little action. And for those of you who want to lead large public organizations, if you really want to get a diverse staff, don't sit back. Go and find the individuals and get them to apply. That's how you do it. Find them and encourage them to apply. You're not offering them the job. We want you to apply. I have found this to be the most effective way of integrating organizations. Get them. Encourage them. Proving the importance of the diversity when you succeed in doing that. Outreach opportunities, a wide array of constituents. Look widely. Don't assume because you're trying to hire a physics professor that somebody in math may not be able to a degree to at least help move that along. Or they know somebody. Or they may be able to do it themselves. Perspectives are very important. And who in the room does matter. Everybody here knows Carolyn Mosley Vaughan, former senator from Illinois. African-American woman one day finds out that her fellow senators, I believe all white at the time, are having a conversation about women of the Confederacy. How do you think she reacted? Their goal was to copyright, if I remember the case, they were trying to, there's, there are few items that are um, protected in terms of copyright, and women of Confederacy is one of these. These, um, I'll have to remind myself of the, the article, are one of these things in which Congress actually acts to grant them that, that copyright protection. She was appalled, appalled that women of the Confederacy were receiving this stamp from the United States government. And a couple senators actually admitted they just came in and voted and left. They didn't really read what it was about, though they had done it before. And she took to the Senate floor and dramatically objected to it. And those senators came back and did a very rare thing. They reversed their vote. Do you think that would have happened if a black woman was not there? Probably not. It does matter who's in the room. When men are all on the tenure committee discussing a tenure case of a female who might have, having a family, been pregnant at the time, needed some time off for research, how sensitive do you think they are to those issues? They are now because I think women stood up and realized that there needs to be some sort of time out when women are pregnant or things going on. Who in the room is very important? 
When I first came here, all of the entire my department heads were men. They were men. So I always felt I had to take the opposite sides of any arguments, particularly when I think it pertained to things that would impact women. We changed that finally. But unless you have a diverse perspective going in, chances are there's going to be groupthink, which is a dangerous thing to get into in a large public organization. Because your constituents, particularly in Connecticut, are not all men. This is a management issue. You want to get everybody's fingerprints on those decisions. And the more diverse it is, the better. Because chances are, if it's a policy issue, somebody's going to disagree someone on. You want to be able to say, well, we had, it was not just one group thinking it. It was widely looked at. Many sources of input is important. If everyone is trained the same, then issues are ignored police. What have we learned from some of the shootings that have occurred by police officers? What do you think the black community says? Their interaction with them. Our department is pretty progressive. In fact, Central has the first and it remains the only accredited police department in the entire system. One of the exercises we did recently is on de-escalation. De-escalation. I happened to be in Paris last year, year before, with my daughter. And I went out, and I was at this uh, place where they're having pastries. She was in the room. And there was an individual outside clearly having a disagreement with an officer in Paris. And the individual was, I mean, I don't speak French, but I could tell it was pretty heated. The officer just listened. And all right, he goes, okay, keep moving. All right, keep moving on. You could tell us it. The guy moved on. Chances are if that was in America, the nightstick would have come on, somebody would have been beat down. Somebody was getting in handcuffs. The individual that's taught this class on de-escalation to our, our um, officers is not just anybody. He was undercover narcotics for NYPD. Pretty significant, very dangerous job. And um, he talked about the issue about backing up. Backing up. You know. When we train police officers in America, they are trained once they arrive on the scene to give commands and take control. That's what they're supposed to do, to bring everything down to a control situation. And he talked about and showed a video of two officers showing up at a scene with a mother who called because she was having some issues with her son. And he appeared at the door. She walked by. He appeared at the door, had a small little screwdriver in his hand. The officers are against a, a car there. They've drawn their weapons, not their tasers, their weapons, and they are yelling at him, drop the weapon, drop the gun, drop the weapon. He does not drop it. As they back up a little, they didn't back up as they, for some reason, one moved to the side, you hear three shots ring out. He is killed. And from there, the story is done. Now, it was classified as a good shoot. Classified as a good shoot. Now, a review by this individual and us will tell you, first thing is they should have backed up, particularly when they knew this individual had some other issues going on. Back up, back up, give some space between the individual as the commands that followed, or as one officer said, it doesn't understand why two pretty good sized officers could not take down this individual without drawing their weapons and firing. Things have changed. We all saw the North Carolina situation when the woman was pulled out of the car, went pretty bad. Eventually she killed herself, committed suicide while in detention. That officer was fired and I believe was facing prosecution. The black community has a certain perspective on these sort of things. And on diversity matters, it's important to understand these things to understand these things. If you're in a community in which significant amount of, of the community speak another language, clearly law enforcement needs to be sure that they are diverse enough to deal with that sort of issue. Could you imagine that you're in Hartford, Connecticut? This is not, this is not real now, I'm just saying. Could you imagine you're in Hartford, Connecticut with a sizable Latino population and you are calling 911 and nobody speaks Spanish in the dispatch? That 
would be wrong. So we work very hard for having a diverse force. Law enforcement is called to many scenes, but that's one, another reason why, particularly in public higher education, diversity is critical, particularly in law enforcement operations. We have a lot of students from different perspectives here. Different perspectives. Central worked very hard on hiring its chief, and one of our requirements was the chief had to have a significant urban experience. A significant urban experience because our kids come from all over the state. They're from Torrington, they're from Hartford, they're from Danbury, and we need to have someone who understands those perspectives going on. The faculty can probably speak to this better. If everybody in the group only has one perspective on training, then you're constrained intellectually to a degree, growing and learning and dealing with all the things. And organizational culture-wise, this is important. Organiza organizational culture is critically important whether public or private organization. That's the culture of that organization. It's hard to grow it if everybody continues to only have the same perspective and, back and background. Um, these are sort of excuses, things I'm always concerned about. When we're doing searches, and people are confusing guidelines with law or procedural things, or people don't want to do something and they claim, well, really, that's not the form you do, this sort of stuff. This goes back to my point I'm making. If you are leading a public organization and you want to really infuse that organization with diverse perspectives and things, then don't just sit back and affirm on diversity. Go out and do something about it because these sort of things, these forms, these policies, these procedures, people hide behind them. And in hiding behind them, they actually do more to damage diversity issues. That, a problem, that can be problematic. A lot of excuses. We always do it that way. You know why? Because we always do it that way. Why? Because that's the way it's done. It can hurt the goal of what you're trying to do. And CBA's collective bargaining agreement. You know, Connecticut is a collective bargaining state. In public higher education, we're highly unionized. And um, sometimes these things are in conflict. But they're usually in conflict because the leadership has not taken the time to actually sit down and work with the leaders of the union on how to deal with these issues. It is, it is a difficult thing to deal with. I have local and statewide unions in my division. And I think we've been able to make inroads on diversity issues because we've been able to, to work cooperatively with um, the unions and bring those things about. When you're rigid and you say it's always been done when you don't do things, somebody's going to challenge you eventually. It may end up in court. And you can't just tell the judge because we've always done it that way. Sometimes you need to review the things you've been doing. Public opinion sometimes shifts. You have to understand that. Um, California last year received higher education, received significant amount of criticism about the number of out-of-state kids, I believe international but they, were, they had in California schools, to the point of where the chair of the Appropriations Committee threatened to cut off appropriations. What do you think happened to the percentage of in-state kids admitted to California schools this year? It went up dramatically. Sometimes we're so busy talking about, you know, that we lose sight of the original reason for the policy and why it was done. Extensive breeds opposition, makes people angry. That means you're not listening sometimes. Why do I talk about evaluations? If you're the head of an agency, issues of diversity are important to you, then you must evaluate it. When I, was, when I was at the University of Connecticut, the president that came in, one of his primary goals was to dramatically improve the diversity of the employees and the students at the university. And how did he do it? The first thing he did was to make sure that that evaluation point was on every single vice president's evaluation. You don't think they paid attention? They paid attention. And he set by example by making sure his staff was diverse. And on issues on diversity, he had his staff review what was the issue going on.
serves as a benchmark. You can see where you are and where you want to go. Terry of stereotypes. Assuming political affiliations can be problematic. We just went through this election, and there were a lot of talk about who was going to vote for who, who's not voting for you. You really don't know those sort of things. Stereotypes can be problematic. Cultural perspectives vary. Gender bias. It used to be, I don't know if it's a, it used to be that um, prosecutors were concerned about having women on rape, rape um, juries because they weren't exactly as maybe sympathetic as they thought they would want for the individual who had gone through such a terrible thing and they were prosecuting an individual involved in rape. You have to be careful in assuming that the bias is, is there. Economic, there's a great article um, one of my favorites are article. It was done by, I believe, Newsweek almost 20 years ago. And it dealt with the issue about the silent rage of successful blacks in America. The idea that those of you, of us who've made it, really have nothing to be upset about. But the underlining talk in it was the day-to-day -day indignities those individuals have to go through. And how about, and, how, and by not recognizing that, it hurt the organization because it bred a lot of tension, resentment, and those things will lead to turnover. Something that a leader needs to understand. Losing touch with your original mission you get so caught up in what you're doing, you forget the real reason you're there. The public has a way of rectifying that, folks, through their legislature. Ignoring <clears throat> elected officials. I've seen this happen on a number of occasions, where the head of the public organization believes in their mission so much and what they're doing so much, they sort of forget the people that actually put them there. Because what can be given can be taken away. Losing touch with the clients. People who have worked at maybe DCF or DSS can tell you these things can be difficult to deal, particularly when you have clients who are in crisis. Um, and there are a lot of stresses on the organization. And that's generally it. I guess the main point I want you to take is there's a difference between public and private leadership and management. But if we are good, decent leaders who try and do our best and make sure that we always recognize that not everybody's the same, that we all come from different perspectives and have different ideas, and we actually try to take that into account before we make a decision, then whether your decision turns out to be good or bad, will not be the final judgment. It would be that you tried. Thank you.